You know, there are warning signs all throughout our lives more than ever before. Every product that you buy has a warning label, a warning sign, something to make sure that when you use it, you don't do something that will cause you harm, or at least if you get harmed, that you can't sue the company that made it. There are a lot of warning signs, but the one that sticks out the most to me, or at least I think is the most compelling, is the one where it's encouraging you to not stick your hand into a piece of equipment or machinery, maybe something with belts while it's running. And we're going to show you a picture of that because that one is the most compelling to me because just looking at it, I cringe. Like, I want to grab my hand. That looks so painful. Most warning signs don't depict what will happen if you ignore them, right? Like when you see roads slippery when wet, you don't see a depiction of an overturned car. When you see a sign that says, stop sign ahead, there isn't a depiction of a collision. Most signs don't depict what will happen to you if you don't obey it. But this one does, and I think it's pretty effective because of that. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, Paul gives them a really clear picture of what will happen if they don't obey his warnings, if they don't heed the warnings that he's giving them. He wants them to recognize the danger. He wants them to recognize that they need to act differently. So he gives them a picture of what will happen if they don't listen. And he doesn't have to draw it. He doesn't have to sketch it. Because there's a perfect example in the history that is found in God's Word that he can refer back to. So let's read the first five verses to get a picture of what it is that he's talking about. Moreover, brothers, I would not that ye should be ignorant. I don't want you to be unaware. How that all our fathers were under the cloud and passed through the sea. Now, Paul is talking about the Hebrew children that were saved from Egypt. They were slaves there. Moses led them out. Remember, let my people go. Leads them towards the promised land. God led them through a cloud. He takes them through the Red Sea. Verse 2, And were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea. And they did all eat the same spiritual meat, and did all drink the same spiritual drink, For they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. There's a moment when Moses is leading the people that they're dying of thirst in the desert, and God provides them water out of a rock, out of a boulder. There's this fountain, and everybody's able to drink. And so Paul's saying, listen, these people, they were were led by God out of Egypt. They They crossed the Red Sea. They drank the water that God provided for them in the desert. But verse 5, But with many of them... God was not well pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. Now that last phrase in verse 5 is pretty vivid. What Paul communicates to them there is pretty clear. Now when we hear the word overthrown today, we typically think of someone overthrowing a government. And so that may not really strike us. But when Paul uses this word, he's not talking about overthrowing authority. He's talking about literally overthrowing. Just like the the, the Gospels tell us that when Jesus went to the temple and he saw all of these people in the temple who were using the temple as a marketplace, he overthrew the tables, turned them over, and all of the money and merchandise went scattering onto the floor. Gordon Fee, in his commentary on Corinthians, says the literal use of this word is to broadcast or to spread out. And the picture that I get in my head is someone taking seed and throwing it out into a field to disperse it. So when this passage says that they were overthrown in the desert, Gordon Fee says, in my mind, the picture that Paul is making and what the Corinthians would have heard is, many of them, God was not pleased with them and their bodies are scattered through the desert. These are people that were led out of Egypt, went through the Red Sea, drank from the rock in the middle of the desert, and yet they didn't make it to the promised land. Why? Because they did not heed the warning that Paul is trying to give to the Corinthians. He wants them to realize, if you don't follow my recommendation, if you don't follow this warning, that's what's going to happen to you. 
even though you're walking with the Lord, even though you're attending the church in Corinth, there's, going, there's this danger. Listen to the warning that I'm giving you. I think there are three responses that Paul wants them to have to this warning. And on the back of your worship guide, your bulletin, there are blanks that you can fill in if you'd like to follow along in that way. The first one is this. Learn from the examples that went before you. Paul wants them to learn from the examples that went before them. He wants them to recognize, listen, just as you have, you've been following God, even though you have been baptized, there were people that they had done that and they ended up on the wrong side of a relationship with God. He says the people that, uh, that God led out of Egypt, they were saved from their slave owners and taskmasters in Egypt, just as you were saved from your bondage and sin. The people that, that God led out of Egypt, he took them to the Red Sea. They were being pursued. God parted the waters of the Red Sea so they could cross through on dry ground. They walked in between both of those walls of water that God had established. It was a miracle. They took a step of faith to walk through that and to separate themselves from Egypt. Just like many of you Corinthians, you were baptized. It was a step of faith and you separated yourself from the pagan temples in Corinth that you used to worship at. He says, listen, they were just like you. But today, they didn't make it to the promised land. Their bodies are scattered in the desert. Now, there have been a couple of occasions in Corinthians that Paul has said, listen, God saved you from here, and now he's brought you here, but keep your eyes on where you're headed. Keep your eyes on the reward that is coming. And the people in in the Hebrew children, the Israelites, they did not keep their eyes on the promised land, and they didn't make it. And Paul is saying to the Corinthians, learn. Learn from their example. Don't do what they did. Don't make the same mistake that they made. Have you ever learned something the hard way when you could have learned it by watching the person right in front of you? It's really frustrating, right? Like, why didn't I just see that they messed up and I needed to do something different from what they did? I worked at a a shoe store uh, when I was in high school. We sold safety shoes, steel-toed boots, and the sign for the store was really close to the parking spaces. And so there was this bright yellow column, cement column, that had put up and been put up in front of the sign because so many people had backed into the sign. And that bright yellow column had marks and smudges and pieces knocked out of it because so many people backed into it. But you know what we saw on a regular basis at our store? People would walk out, get into their car, and back right into that post. There were even people that we said, hey, Just a heads up, there's that post back there, don't back into it. One time that happened. A man who had bought some shoes backed into the post, and then when he hit that post, he panicked. And when he went to put it back in drive to move away from the post, his foot got stuck between the accelerator and the brake, and he came right through the front of our store. It was the end of the day. We got to call it off early. I remember we called the owner and said, hey, someone just drove their car through the front of the store. And he was like, what? We had to repeat it several times. Even though that that post was there to keep people from backing into the sign, even though it was all battered people regularly, Paul is saying, listen, look at the Hebrews. See the example. See the mistake that they made. Don't make the same mistake. But we, we really struggle with this. Because we know that some of the mistakes that our parents make, we find ourselves making the exact same mistakes. We tell ourselves growing up, I'm not going to do what dad did. I'm not going to be like my mother. And then what happens? We find ourselves acting exactly like them. Paul says, don't make the same mistake that they made. So what was the mistake that they made? What was the problem that they had? Let's look at verses 6 to 8, and we'll see there exactly what was the issue. Verse 6 says, Now these things were our examples, to the intent that we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. Neither be ye idolaters, as were some of them. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink 
and rose up to play. Neither let us commit fornication as some of them committed and fell in one day three and twenty thousand. Skip down uh, with me to verse 12. Wherefore, let him that thinketh he stand take heed lest he fall. Therefore, there hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above what you are able, but will with the temptation make a way of escape that you may, may be able to bear it. Wherefore, my dearly beloved, and one of those last three words there, flee from idolatry. What's idolatry? Idolatry is the worship of an idol. This was a major problem in Old Testament times, so much so that one of the Ten Commandments is, Thou shalt not make a graven image. In other words, you will not make a little god to worship. Because they would make themselves statues and idols, little things that they would build and set up in their homes or in a temple and go and worship them. And one of the problems that the Israelites had was that they worshipped other gods. And it was so much a problem, God said, one of the commands... One of the top ten commands is, don't make an idol. Now, I don't think that there's anybody in here today that you have, you've broken that commandment. That you have cut down a tree, carved it into some figure, and bowed down and worshipped it. That's not something that happens very often today. But we still struggle with idolatry. We still struggle with this. You see, idolatry is looking for what only God can provide somewhere other than God. It's looking for what only God can provide somewhere other than God. You see, you might not be bowing down to some carved image today, but I am going to bet that there are some things in your life that you're looking to them to provide you with joy or peace or happiness. You're looking to a person you're looking to a substance, you're looking to some behavior, this is what's going to give me happiness or pleasure. That's what happened to the Hebrew children. They were looking to sources other than God for what they needed. Now, there are two really stark applications from this warning. One is, you can know God and still fall for idolatry. You can know the true God and still fall for idolatry. You can know the true and living God who sent his son to die on a cross for us and still look to other sources for what it is that you need in this life. My father worked for the airlines. And one day he was working at the airport and a man that was a family friend showed up at the airport. It's kind of unexpected. Now my, my father knew that this man's family had been going through some, some issues. But when he saw him at the airport, he didn't think that. He just asked him what you typically would ask someone at the airport. Where are you headed? And the man said, I'm headed overseas to meet this woman that I've been talking with online. Now here's the problem. This man who was a family friend, he had a wife and three beautiful children. And he just tells my father, I'm going over to meet this woman. And my dad begged him not to get on that airplane. My dad told me later on, he said, Daniel, I would quote verses of scripture to him. And he would finish them with me and say, I know, but I'm going. You see, he knew the truth, but he was looking for answers in something else other than God. And if you're here this morning and you're a believer, I want you to recognize what Paul is saying. You can be following God and start looking elsewhere for what only he can provide. You can be following God and start looking elsewhere for happiness and joy and peace. So the first stark application is you can know God and fall for idolatry. And the second is you can see miracles and fall for idolatry. Some people think, well, I, Pastor Daniel, that, the guy in your story, I'm not like that guy because not, not only do I know God, but I'm like really committed to him. And I'm devoted and I serve and God's used me to do some really incredible things. I've seen God work in miraculous ways, so that'll never happen to me. Did you hear what I said about the Hebrew children? 
God rescued them from their slave owners in Egypt, brought them across the desert, gave them water from a rock, parted a sea so that they could cross over, fed them daily with manna that appeared on the ground. All of these miraculous things are happening all around them, and still they were like, hmm, maybe this God can give us what it is that we really want. Maybe this temptation can give me what I really want. You see, you, you can be a follower of God, be serving God and committed, and still experience temptation to look for what only God can provide elsewhere. On a regular basis, effective pastors who preach so well that thousands listen to them fall away from the Lord because they look to something else other than God to meet their needs. There is no length of time with God, no intensity of experience with Jesus that will make you immune to temptation. Every person here needs to hear this message. Whether you've been following Jesus for years or not, you can fall prey to idolatry. So Paul is saying, listen, no one is immune to this temptation. No one is immune to falling prey to this. I'm giving you an example of people who were following God, saw them do incredible things, and they fell into idolatry. So hear me. Run for your life. Or in this case, run for your soul. That's the reason that in verse 14 he says, Flee! Run! Run from idolatry! Now, some of you like to run. And some of you... Running is the last thing that you want to do today. But there are scenarios where every one of us would run if there was danger. There was harm. And what Paul is saying is, run, flee, get away from it. You see, the reason that they're talking about this is that there's tons of temples in Corinthians and some of the people were going there and they were buying meat there because they could get it for a great price. And Paul's already talked to them about the issue of the meat, but he's saying, listen, the meat's not a big deal, but the idols are a huge deal. They're dangerous. Stay away from them. Run for your life. Say, okay, Pastor Daniel, I need to stay away from idols. Pretty sure I can do that okay in Evansville. Not a whole lot of statues that people worship. You're right. Not a whole lot of idols in southern Indiana that people bow down before and worship. But there are plenty of opportunities to look for what only God can provide in something else. And I want to to talk to you about six modern idols. And he mentions them here in this passage because they're modern, but they're not new. They're idols that people have been struggling with for years. In verse 7, he says, They ate and drank and rose up to play. He gives us the first three. First of all, they ate food. The Hebrews regularly struggled with food. They often complained about the food that God was giving them for free. Moms and dads, you can relate to this, right? Like, you buy food at the grocery store, you prepare it for your kids, you put it in front of them, and they go, what? I don't like this. I don't like this kind of pizza. I don't like this type of macaroni and cheese. Like, what? They regularly struggled over the issue of food. Regularly. And many of us, if we're honest, we look to food to handle our stress. We look to food to give us a feeling of satisfaction that we're not receiving in life. We look to food to give us what only God can provide us. We choose food over our health. We choose food over community. Some of us are so addicted to worshiping the idol of food that the only way that you come to church is if we throw a dinner. (laughs) Food is an idol in our day. It was then too. They ate and drank and rose up to play. Back then it was kind of hard to get drunk. You had to really work at it. Alcohol, wine, liquor, it wasn't as strong as it is today. It's a whole lot easier to get drunk today. Some of us, it's maybe harder because you've conditioned your body 
through years of practice that it's harder to get drunk. But they got filled up on food, drunk on wine, and rose up to play. There are many people who worship the bottle in our culture today. And it's easier than ever before to worship that idol. And back then, to get that feeling of being drunk, of being numb, of being courageous, of feeling happy when everything was going wrong, you only had one option. Today we have lots of options. Because you can take a pill or smoke something. You can even get a prescription for it. And there are many people who are looking to a substance to give them only what only God can provide. They ate and drank and rose up to play. Now, there's a connotation of immorality here, but we'll get to that in a second. But really what they did is they ate and they drank and they got up to do whatever it is that they wanted to do. And we worship this God in a huge way in our culture. We do what we want to do when we want to do it. We do what sounds like fun. We even go as far to say as we need it. I need a day on the golf course. I need a day by the pool. I need a day on the lake. I need it. And I get what we're saying. We're saying we're stressed. We're ready for some relaxation. We're ready for some rest. But you know what you need? You need what we just sang about. Lord, I need you. You need Jesus. You want to relax. You need Jesus. You want to play. You need Jesus. You want a day on the water. Let's make that distinction clear. They worshipped it. There's nothing wrong with playing golf. As long as you can do it without saying all the bad words, which not many people can do. Nothing wrong with going out on a boat. Nothing wrong with playing ball. Nothing wrong with play. In fact, God tells us to take time to play and to rest and to relax. God made it one of the commands that we take a day a week to rest and worship. But if we're worshiping play if we're worshiping relaxation, if we're worshiping our hobbies, they're an idol. And we're looking to it to get what only God can provide. Now, in our culture today, we worship sports like no other. It's crazy. It's crazy. Now, I I just want to tell you that in the Old Testament, there was this God named Baal, He was a false god, an idol. They worshipped him, and some people even sacrificed their children to him. Today, we don't worship Baal, we worship ball. We we worship the ball field. We worship travel teams. We worship the, the next league up. And there's a lot of moms and dads putting an incredible amount of pressure on their kids to succeed in sports because of something that's lacking in mom and dad's life. And the pressure that you're putting on your child to get something back, pride, is hurting them. Now, I'm not telling you that if your kids play sports that that's wrong. I played sports growing up. My kids are going to play sports as long as they're good at it. If they're not good at it, they're not going to play because I don't want them embarrassing me. <laughs> I'm kidding, but that's kind of where it comes from, right? We want our kids to make us proud. And if we're worshiping that, if we're looking to it to provide what only God can provide, it's an idol. They ate and drank and rose up to play. The fourth idol, the fourth modern idol is verse 8, neither neither let us commit fornication as some of them committed. I don't need to go over again that our sex-crazed culture promotes adultery, pornography. Um, We need to be running from that. We need to be running in the opposite direction from all of that. That doesn't mean that we run from sex, but we run from immorality. The fifth is greed. Verse 6 says, To the intent that we should not lust after evil things as they lusted. The Hebrew children were greedy. They wanted nicer things all the time. They wanted stuff. They cried like children in the store. Look at verses 9 and 10. It says, Neither let us tempt Christ as some of them also tempted him and were destroyed of serpents. Neither murmur ye as some of them also murmured and were destroyed. Paul's referring to this one point in the desert. They're making their journey across the desert and the people are complaining because the food that they're getting isn't the food that they want. 
They're getting food provided to them every day, but they're being really picky. And they go as far as to say, we miss the food in Egypt. The food in Egypt was awesome. You remember that? Man, I wish we could go back to Egypt. Now think about how crazy that is. What were they in Egypt? They were slaves in Egypt. But what were they thinking? The food in Egypt was really good. I'd be, I'd be willing to go back and become a slave if I could have some more of those fish and onions that they got out of the Nile. That was some good eats. They were so greedy, they were willing to sell their souls, even sell themselves back into slavery in that moment. They wanted it so bad. They were so greedy. You know what happens to us? We see something that we want, and we are willing to sell ourselves into debt, sell ourselves into working all the time so that we can get that one thing that we want so bad. Some of you are practically slaves. Because you have to work all the time to pay for the things that you really, really wanted. They wanted it so bad, they were willing to go back into slavery. So they're saying, God, we wish we could go back to Egypt where we were slaves and eat that food. And so God sends serpents among them. Now, (laughs) that's a pretty effective punishment. I mean, wow. I I hate snakes. Like, hate snakes. Terrified of snakes. Don't want to see a snake. No good snakes. You're like, oh, this this snake is is not, he's harmless. Every snake is bad. Every snake is bad. Only good snake, dead snake. It's the only good snake. If I saw a snake, I'm out of here, man. I'm running. I'm gone. I heard a story. This guy who's part of a gospel singing group. They travel from church to church singing. They were in some small church in the Appalachian Mountains, and the people started pulling out snakes to handle. And he turned to the guy that was singing with him. He's like, do they have a back door? He's like, I don't think so. He says, where do you think they want one? Because I'm about to make one. That would be me. Like, I'm out the door. I'm making the door. I'm gone. You know what Paul's saying to them here? Flee from these sins. Flee from these temptations. They're dangerous. And there'll be people who say, oh, it's harmless. It's no big deal. Run. There is no good temptation. There is no good idol. Run. Run from it. Then lastly, number six, the last idol is self. Paul said in verse 12, Let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. Paul was saying, some of you are so in love with yourself that you need to heed this warning because you're about to trip up and fall. Some of us, the God that we worship is us. It's ourselves. We are so enamored with us how awesome we are, how much we know, how good we are. Some people act toward themselves like a devoted follower acts toward their God. We often refer to these people as narcissists. The reason is because in Greek mythology, there's the story, this myth of a character named Narcissus who was so in love with himself, he thought he was amazing, he saw a reflection of himself in a pond, a lake, and depending on which version you read, he laid there until he died, or he reached in trying to grab it and fell in and drowned. But the moral of the the myth is, he saw something that he desperately wanted himself, how beautiful he was. And every time he reached for it and he touched the water, the reflection would go away, because the water had been disturbed. And so the thing that he desperately wanted, he could not get, because it was just a reflection That's not only the moral of Narcissus' story, it's the moral of every one of these idols. Every one of them. Everyone on this list promises you something, portrays something that it can never give you because the only place that you can receive it is from above. The only place you can get it. Only place. So he says... Learn from the examples that went before you. Flee from the idolatry that's all around you. And then lastly, honor the God who is above you. The problem with idols is that they don't transcend the problems that we have. It's silly to think that someone would take a piece of wood, you know, cut down a tree. Isaiah mocks someone who cuts down a tree and decides half of it is good to carve an idol out of and half of it is good for firewood. Like, how do you know which part of the tree trunk is 
divine. But when we create these gods, they're just carrying on the problems that we have. Greek mythology, if you read any Greek mythology, all of the, 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 the powers, the gods in Greek mythology, they were just as flawed as all of the people. Why? Because they were created by the people. And they had all of their faults. They were petty, vengeful. If we look around us, we're not going to find the answers to our problems. If we try to create something to solve our problems, we're not going to find the answer to our problems. We've got to stop looking around us and start looking above. Because that's where the solutions come from. You will not find the answers to your problems around you. It's above you. So throughout the rest of this chapter, Paul goes through, he talks a lot more about idols and meat. But at the very end, in verse 33, he says, Whatsoever you do, whatsoever you eat, whatsoever you drink, whatever it is that you do around you, honor and glorify the Lord. And all that you do, whatsoever you do, honor and glorify the Lord. You see, all this stuff around us, it's not meant to be God to us. It's not meant for us to worship. It's meant for us to live around as we worship God. And we can honor Him in all that we do. That's what we need to do. You know what's beautiful about how Paul ends the passage there on look above and honor the God above? He's telling us to do something that we can actually do. The gods that we create... They're impossible to please. Why? Because, well, one, they don't have any emotions. They're just an idol. It's a statue. You can't please that statue. And people in Corinth that were going to these pagan temples and worshiping, they would walk away from the temple not really knowing if they had done enough, not really knowing if they were devoted enough, not really knowing if they had brought enough or given enough. But the message that Paul tells them is that in Christ, we are enough. You see, it's impossible to satisfy the false gods of this world, but the true God has made us satisfactory in Christ. Because the Bible tells us that Jesus died on the cross to take our sin and our shame and make us acceptable before God. And so when we come to worship the one true God, we come to honor and please Him. We don't have to walk away saying, I wonder if I pleased Him. I wonder if I honored Him. I wonder if He's happy with my life. Because when He looks at me, He sees the sacrifice of Jesus, and He is pleased with Jesus. We're talking about the Trinity tonight in our evening service. We're talking about there are a couple times that God speaks from heaven, and He speaks about Jesus. And you know what He says? This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And when I put my faith in Jesus, when I give my life to Jesus, when God looks at me, he doesn't see my sin and my shortcomings. He doesn't see my shame. He doesn't see my sacrifice that isn't enough. He sees Jesus in whom he is well pleased. And whereas all of the idols in this life, you give them more and more and more, and they're still not satisfied. You give it more and more and more and still not satisfied. When we come to God, he sees Jesus and he's satisfied. We can honor God because he's made it possible for us to honor him. That's beautiful. That's compelling. And I hope that today what you're left with is a picture of a God who is satisfied with us in Christ. Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer.